Okay, this is Mark Wright from Argos Dog Training, and I'm very excited today because I'm going to have Mr. Larry Crone on, and I'm doing an interview with him. A little bit about Larry. He is the owner of Pack Masters Dog Training in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and in Nashville, Tennessee. He was a federal agent for 20 years and a dog trainer for over 20 years. Last year, he passed 100 million views on his YouTube channel. He's the author of a book, Everything You Need to Know About E-Collar Training. Um, I've known Larry personally for the last few years, and before that, I've known him for a few additional years through his reputation and the work that he's doing. Um, he's known all over the country as an aggression expert, a person who deals with dog aggression on a regular basis, and he's an expert at it countrywide, um, meaning that he's good at it. You know, people know him everywhere for it. Also, as an e collar expert, um, I've learned a lot about e collar from him. I've watched him use it. Um, so, yeah, he's a good opportunity for me to have Larry on. Today, we'll be talking about Dante, which is his puppy, um, and about the, you know, the challenges that even professional dog trainers have with puppies. Okay, little buddy. Welcome home, Dante. You're about to start a life of fulfillment, happiness, and love. You're going to be your best dog ever, buddy. I promise you. I'm so happy. I hope you enjoyed the video. Not to take any more time, but here it goes. For coming on and um, doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Um, congratulations on a new addition to your family, Dante. Uh, yeah, thank you. No, thank you, buddy. Appreciate you having me. Looking forward to it. Excellent. So, um, Dante, how old is Dante now? He just turned 16 weeks old Friday. All right, so he's four months old at this point. Um, how's it going with him? It sucks. I hate him. <laughs> okay, kid. <laughs> it's it's man. It's, it's he's a good dog. It's a lot of work. It's 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 just been. It's been one thing after the other. Sometimes that's how it goes with puppies. You know, I'm traveling a lot right now, doing seminars, and um, the first seminar I did when I had him, I took him with me because I like that as part of his training. I want the dog to travel with me. Right. And what happened was when I took him after my first seminar, I took him for his second round of shots. Now he came, he, that puppy flew from Boston to Chicago. No problems. I drove from the Nashville area to go pick him up in Chicago, drove him all the way home. No problems, no issues in the car, got off the plane. Fine. And then after his second round of shots, I put him in the car and within five to 10 minutes, he was throwing up. Oh. And I figured, okay, it's, it's, it's from the shots. You know, they're, we're putting a lot of poison in these puppies. The problem is it's never gone away. It's never gone away. So he gets very sick in the car, which really sucks because I have not taken him nearly out in the car to different places. Like I like to with these, these puppies, you know, and, uh, while I was gone this time, he ate something real bad and got extremely, I mean, like very, very sick where we were very worried. And so it's, it's been, it's been a lot of, a lot of, uh, early mornings and middle of the nights going out and all that good stuff. But that's, that's part of it, man. That's, that's, that's what you deal with sometimes, you know, that's definitely part of it. So, um, as you know, I have a list of questions, but you already said sure. something very interesting that I want to touch on. Um, the car sickness, how, yeah. like, what, what's your, what are you doing, you know, to try to help him get past that? Well, you know, when we, we realized that it wasn't going away, um, the second seminar I took him to, he, um, within 20 minutes he was thrown up. My daughter was traveling with me. So we, we pulled over, I got him some Dramamine and usually with the Dramamine, these dogs will be fine, had no effect. Hmm. So he threw up the whole five hour trip there, the whole five hour trip back. So it was a nightmare. And the only thing 
I could do now is just put him in the car, go for really, really short trips before he gets sick, take him out, play with him, you know, have a good time, put him back in the car, take him back and go home. Normally these puppies will grow out of that. I just hope he grows out of it really soon because I want to take him on these road trips that I'm doing. You know, it's, that's a big part of the training for me. I want him with me. Definitely. Um, when you travel with him in the car, how do you do that? Do you put him in a crate in the car? Oh yeah, Is he in the back yeah. of the car, the middle or front. Yeah, in in in, in the in the back. Oh, at this age, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't take a chance on have him uncrated or anything. He's he's in a he's in a crate always when we're when we're traveling. You know, definitely. I I I know you probably know this stuff, but I'm gonna give a tip for what I would normally do. Um. I would, first of all, I try not to feed them before I go. Um, sure. I would, yeah. I, I would, at the bottom of the crate, I would cut out a bathroom mat. So that way it gives him traction, you know, so that way he's able to stay. So I cut out a bathroom mat to fit inside the crate. Yeah, it could get a little messy, but I think the traction a lot of times helps the dog. I also try to cover the crate um, because, yeah. because car sickness, motion sickness comes sure. through the eyes. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and actually, I do keep a, a towel on the whole bottom of the crate. And um, what that also does is when they throw up in a crate and the towel, it stays in one place. Yes. So it doesn't get all over the pot. That, that was the one good thing about the last trip. Even though he threw up a lot, he stayed clean because he would throw up in one corner. I threw out a lot of towels along the trip. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, so yeah, it, and, and those are good tips, you know, and, and a lot of times just doing those little things will work, but those, those shots, they really affected him in a, in a big way, yeah. you know, I mean, really in a big way. And I hope, I hope it goes away soon. I do too. Um, the bathroom that has that rubber on the bottom and that makes yeah. the mat stick, you know, a little bit. Um, that's the yeah. only difference. Um, so, uh, what was my next question here? Hmm. Yeah, I like that idea too. By the way, I'll definitely do that. It, it yeah. has worked. It has worked many times for me. Um, other yeah. things I do is just play with the dog in the back of the trunk. You know, just play. Yeah. I always tell my clients make a five minute trip instead of getting gas on the way to work. Make it a trip to go to the gas station. You know, right. it's usually like a couple right. minutes away. Little yeah, things. Yeah, see, like that's that. that's exactly what I do. I have a gas station within five minutes, and that's where I'll go. I'll go there, I'll play with them there, and then I come home because he's good on five minute trips, you know, maybe even ten minutes, but I'm not I'm not pushing it right now. Yeah. I my min pin, um, when she gets her shots, I always talk to the vet. I'm like, Are you sure this is enough? My min pin is seven pounds, man. Is this the same shot you give to the Great Dane? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. because she's seven pounds. There has to be but you know, um, it is the, it some... is the same shot. That's what's scary. It's the same shot that a Great Dane gets. Right. You know, um, it's insane. And, uh, man. and if you talk to the right vets, a lot of the times they will be like, "Yeah, I actually do the math and figure it out." But those are hard to find. Those kind of vets <laughs> who spend the time to do that, you know, they're yeah, hard. But sure. when you find them, they're gold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? big time. Um, all right. So, what kind of breed is Dante? He's a she black shepherd, German shepherd. German shepherd. Yeah. Excellent. Have you had yeah. German shepherds before? I have. Um, and the reason I got this dog, well, actually, this was a surprise. My wife and kids surprised me with the puppy for retirement. But I had worked with this breeder, one of this breeder's dogs before. I've had a black shepherd here. I've done a lot of videos with. His name was Patton. Mm -hmm. And he came from... Terry McCormick up your way in Massachusetts and uh, Terry's really really very very good at what he does with the breeding and he's kind of goes over the top in, in everything he does with, with his his dogs and I was so impressed with the dog that I've trained from his and my wife knew that and and that's why she went with this dog you know he's a really nice puppy he definitely has everything that I want you know, super drive, um, super stable. Nothing, nothing faces him. I just hate his guts right now. That's all. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it goes with the puppy. I try to let people know, like, there's, there's a until they're about two, I think. You know, until they're about two, there's because the, after you get through all the little puppy stuff, 
Then you get into the adolescence, and we know what adolescence is. And then, yeah. and then after that, you get an adult dog. Usually, well, and it's it's funny you say that, Martin, because I do consider my dogs. Of course, training never stops, but that first two years is where I put all the work in. You know, I mean, I consider them like totally in training until they're two years old. And if you bust your butt enough those first two years, then you you have the opportunity to create a pretty self-sufficient dog, you know? I agree, because you don't let them practice things that you don't want them to practice. Sure. And then because they're not rehearsing those things, um, the habits kick in, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. So once it becomes a, lot, a habit. A lot. I, I, I prefer to create the dog I want than fixing behaviors along the way. Yep, it's always hard to unspoil a tomato. <laughs> like, how do you unspoil that tomato again? Uh, yeah, That's it's, great. It's, it's tricky. Um, all right. So, uh, so why? So I know you choose them because um, of Terry McCormick. Um, yeah. You know. Um, so that makes perfect sense. Do you know anything what he did with the puppy before you got him? Yeah, ter Terry. Terry does a, do a ton of things, but I don't. I don't like to. I don't know if he wants me to give away his secrets, you know. But all the little things, um, like the puppy's hunt drive, the ability to hunt for his food and his 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 drive in general, um, his ability to deal with big noises and big bangs and just the environment. Terry does so many little things to prepare him, you know, and he was sending me videos along the way. And for, for one, and one of the things that impressed me most, to be honest with you, was Terry wasn't happy about the puppy's drive. He was concerned that he wasn't going to have what I wanted. I wasn't concerned with it. Puppy has it. He just came along a little later. But for a breeder to tell you that, that, that means a lot, that kind mm -hmm. of honesty, you know. But I remember in one of the videos he sent me, I think he took some pots and pans or something and dropped them right next to the puppy, you know, to see the puppy's reaction. And uh, there was no reaction. The puppy nice. can care less. You nice. know, a lot of puppies in that case would take off scared to death. You know what I mean? And even if this puppy would have jumped back a little and looked at it and come and check it out, that would have been fine. But no, he didn't. He didn't really care at all so he's a very very solid nerves and that's really the most important thing to me i want a very stable dog you know all right so that's more important to you than the drive would be yeah it, it is because although i plan on doing something with him i do plan on competing in igp with him hopefully if if the drive was oh you know you don't need a psychopath to create a really good dog you, you know i have one of those and sometimes it gets to be a lot and i'm a little older <laughs> now i don't i don't need a dog that's over the top crazy you know i'd rather have one with good drive and good nerves and good stability and just attempt to make that dog the best that i can you know I, i'm not I'm not trying to be a world champion at anything you know where i have a dog that's going to live in my backyard and just come out when he goes on the field that's just not my thing and so my dogs are always going to be my family pets first you know Excellent. and i want to be able to take the dog on vacation with us just like we do with mango and i don't have to worry about him when there's people around and kids around i want him to be comfortable in all situations that's what's most important to me so having a dog with a lower star or reflex definitely will help with that. Sure. And that's yeah, something, absolutely. Do you think that's something uh -huh. that you could ask um, uh, a standard AKC breeder about? Like if you're getting a golden retriever, is that something that you would feel comfortable asking a breeder about? Yeah, yeah. You, you know what? The only problem is, Martin, you could ask everything. And so many breeders, just like trainers, they're always going to tell you what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. You know? Trying to sell and so I, I've been fortunate to deal with some, you know, really good breeders, Terry being the most recent, then both my Malinois come from Mohawk Malinois, John and Paula, you know, both phenomenal dogs, the German Shepherd that we trained a few years back for the, for our soldier, you know, that came from Titan Shepherds and, and, and Lisa Muller who donated that puppy to us. So I've dealt with some really good people, you know, and, and I'm very fortunate there. Excellent. Mm -hmm. For all you German Shepherd people out there, remember those names. All right. So, so uh, how's so sleeping through the night? I know you mentioned a little bit 
about um about getting up and things like that. Tell me what's going on with that. He's he was doing really well. He was at one point I remember him sleeping, you know, six maybe even seven hours from like 10 o'clock at night to I think like five in the morning, which is great. And that was early on. And I'm not sure what happened. I went away and I left him home and I came back and he was having a lot of accidents. He was peeing a lot. And I'm not exactly sure why I think, I think maybe I probably wasn't being clear enough on telling my family how much water to give them. They were probably giving them too much water because I wasn't very specific. And what I said was make sure he drinks enough that he's not dehydrated. Mm -hmm. That was bad on my part. Okay. So that set us back there. Um, so once that starts, if that happens once, then I'm getting up all the time before it happens. So now I just got back in the habit of going backwards and now I measure out his water. So I know how much he's drinking through the day and he was definitely getting too much. Mm -hmm. I was definitely giving him too much water. It, it adds up quick, you know? And so he's been, he's been good now, but I still get up at three in the morning just to make sure he's good and take him out. Excellent. Um, is he in the crate overnight? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. My puppies sleep in the crate until they're one year old, no matter how well trained they are. And then they're left in the, they're not left outside of the crate when we're not home until they're two years old. That's about the age where they're mature enough. If you put in the work and teach them properly where you could leave the dogs out, they're not going to destroy your house, you know? Right. But every dog matures a little bit differently. Sure. Um, yeah, and, absolutely. And two years old is just like, yeah, it's, it's round then, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. I remember. Yeah. How, yeah. Just the rule of thumb. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Like the, like the shepherds and the Rottweilers dogs that I've had, you know, raised, they're easy. They get there. The mallet, some of the Malinois can be a little more difficult, you know, if, if you get one that's just bred to always be on edge and crazy, and there's a lot of them out there. Mm -hmm. Both of mine are good. Both my Malinois, even though they're very high drive, they chill in the house. They know how to come in and just go lay down, you know? Understood. Where in the house is the crate? So, two questions. Where in the house is his primary crate located, and do you have a secondary crate for him? Yeah, I, I like one next to my bed so he's all my dogs sleep in my bedroom they're not in crates just the puppy and so i don't want to separate him socially i just want him separated physically i want him to be part of the family so we have the crate in the room but then there's also a crate where we spend most of the time in the living room so in the live until he can handle that freedom he's mm -hmm. either on a long leash or in the crate because if you let a puppy just wander free they're going to find places to hide and pee and poop and chew things and run up the stairs and get in trouble. Yep. So I'm kind of fanatical about controlling everything at this age, you know? Right, because you have to house train him. You have to teach him what's yeah. right and teach him what's yeah, right. Yeah, although he's, he's pretty good about jumping on a on a on one of the dog beds and hanging out there with the toy. He, he likes to actually chill like that. He's pretty good like that. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So, so do you have a second crate? Yeah, one in the living room, one in the bedroom. All right. Um, do you find that he likes one of them better than the other one? No, no. Um, you know, I make it a pretty cool place right from the start. You, you know, um, I keep the door open. I throw food in. I throw toys in. I leave toys in there. He can come and go. And from day one, I start luring the puppy into the crate with food and I start telling him kennel and I throw the food to the back of the crate, you know, so he gets in that routine and because he's a puppy and he goes in and out so many times, those repetitions build up very fast yep. to where he, even the first time I left him home for my wife to take care of, she, she even commented like, man, he runs right in his crate on his own, lays down. I'm like, yeah, we've, we've prepped him for that. So then it doesn't take long before you could stop luring him with food and he'll go in there and wait for the reward, you know? So little things like that are important to me. One of the things I try to do when I'm crate training a puppy um, is I try to teach him to stay in the crate with the door open. Absolutely. Like to go yeah. in on command, like I ask him to go into the crate. Okay, you're in there, good job, stay in there. <laughs> um, do, you, yeah. do you do that as well? 100%, and you know, you know what, Martin? Not even just with puppies, 
when I have dogs here that I'm training, boarding trains, and all my dogs, so I have four now, and they're all out in the same area. When it's feeding time, I like all the doors open of the pens where all the dogs are just waiting for me, to, and they all eat with their doors open also. Little things like that are things that people don't really focus on, and I think that's such a huge mistake because I think little, little tiny exercises like that create really, really big behavior. You know yeah. what I mean? It's incorporated in life. A lot of times I hear all the time, I don't want to make the crate a punishment. Well, then use it all the time. It can't be a punishment if you're using it that's, all the that's time. That's right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's just if, I left, if I left the crate, if I left the big crate out and just left the door open, every single one of my dogs would try to go in there and lay down. Yeah. Every single one of them. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's never been a punishment for them, you know? Right. Right. Um, and also, how about that fear of using the crate as a punishment? Let's say your, your puppy is, let's say you're cooking breakfast, you're minding your business, you have the puppy out on the leash, he goes for your ankles and he starts play biting, but you really need to get breakfast done. Do you consider yeah. putting the puppy in the crate at that time a punishment, or do you just no. consider it, I need to do this thing? Yeah, no, it's a convenience as far as I'm concerned. You, you know, I think your your attitude and your tone and your demeanor is more whether it's punishment or not. You know what I mean? And uh, and even even if you do get pissed off at the little thing and, and you're angry, if you're constantly using the crate properly like we're talking about, it's not going to be a big deal, you know? Right, right. Excellent. Yeah, because you set up all these associations where sure. it's not just when the puppy's misbehaving, but also when the puppy is being good. As a matter of fact, some of the best thing the puppy the puppy does is around the crate, right? Yeah. So yeah, that, absolutely. That's really cool. So, what's your plan to get to get back to your regular get up hours? How do you plan to, to move that from three a.m. to like when Larry gets up? <laughs> well, I get up pretty early anyway. I'll start working on it now. Um, I planned on it already, but he he got when I say sick, I we were worried about him. Like yeah. he was that sick while yeah. I, and I was gone. Um, so my wife and kids were up with him around the clock. He ate. We had a bad storm here and it looked like toilet paper or paper towel or something blew into the yard. Mm. And when they took him out at night, he grabbed it and ate it mm. and got de deathly sick. I mean, anything like on that. The, yeah. the puke in, if he didn't puke it up and couldn't start holding something down, we we're going to have to take him, see if he, but he didn't have a blockage because he was able to drink and nothing came up. But he, uh, he woke me up at one thirty this morning. He's really good about it. He won't poop in his crate. And at one thirty, he, he started barking and I ran him outside. I mean, ran him and he had a, he had a poop bad and it was still diarrhea, but not as bad as it was. So it's getting better, but slowly. So, for the past few days, he's been eating rice and pumpkin. That's it. Rice. I just started adding a little kibble back to, to that mixture, you know, see how his stomach can handle it. And so far, so good. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so getting them from 3 a.m. till 5 a.m. or yeah. till 6 a.m. What's, what, what's the plan there? I, did, I missed I'll it. Push <laughs> it. I'll push it to 3.30. And see how he does a couple of days there. And I think he's going to be fine. Um, I could probably push him to six already, like right to six o'clock. Since I started measuring how much water he's drinking during the day. Um, he's just one of those puppies that, you know, I cut his water off at around 7 p.m., mm -hmm. his second meal. And he's one of those puppies, if he drinks a lot at 7 p.m., if I take him out at 8 p.m., he doesn't pee a lot. You know, even at 10 p.m. when I take him out for the last time, he doesn't pee that much. It kind of takes him a while to where his bladder is really full yeah. because when I take him out at 3 a.m., he pees a lot. Yeah. Like, And so that's just how his system works. And you have to pay attention to those things. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. He doesn't he doesn't want to pee in his crate. You know, I've never really dealt much with that before because I am kind of fanatical about getting the puppies out. But now that I know what he needs for his body, the way he functions, I just give it to him until he can go longer. That's it. Understood. Um, little tip that I use for my puppies is I usually, I feed my dogs at seven like you do, um, but yeah. my puppies, I feed them at five. 
I give them their last water at five. Um, yeah, and yeah. Then, and then, yeah, you don't get any more. Because the hope is the same hope you have, which is by time you go to bed, empty dog. <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, you're, 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 you're probably yeah. much better off like that, for sure. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's move on here. So um, let's see, play biting, which is a very common yeah. puppy thing. Um, I am certain your puppy is play bitten. Either you or somebody in your family is that something you see? Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know it's kind of funny because with the working dogs, or you have a dog that's going to do bite sports and stuff. There's it's very mixed opinions on what people do. Some people won't stop it because they don't want to inhibit his biting for the the protection sports. Me, I don't allow it. You know, you're, you're not going, I'm going to, I'm going to let you bite. I'm going to let you bite a lot, but I'm going to let you bite the right thing. You're not going to bite me. You you, you know, I just, I don't allow it. And just like no different with any other puppies. I just take the little back of his neck and say, knock it off, you know, enough. And they get it really easy. It doesn't take that much, you you know, and he, he picks up on things very, very easily. And he's never really been um, very, I don't think any of my dogs have been really bad with the the biting of of all of us. And all my dogs bite like really well, you know what I mean? But (laughs) excuse me, it's never really been an issue. Yeah. Yeah. See, I get that too. Um, puppy, even puppies that come to my puppy kindergarten, doesn't bite you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. I think um, I think um, when you present your yourself, the way you present yourself to a puppy or a dog, you know, is very very important. You know, very important. Just like the statement you just said. Yeah, absolutely. When you're presenting yourself and you're an owner and you do so many things wrong and you give the puppy everything it wants and there are no consequences for anything and it's yes, 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 yes. And there's no control of space. There's no control of resources. You raise a little demon and biting just goes along with that. You you know what I mean? That's it. It's a way that they could use to get control as a little puppy using their mouth. And they're like, yeah, I don't want to. So. Or you Absolutely. should be playing with me and you're not. So, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, definitely. 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 So, um, do you get down on the floor a lot with your puppy for like no reason other than to cuddle? Yeah, I do. You yeah, do? I spend a lot of time on the floor, but I do it with grown dogs too. All right. You know, um, I do it with dogs I don't know. At seminars, I spend a lot of time on the floor with dogs. I like to get down on their level. You see a whole different dog when you're down on the ground with their level, Mm -hmm. complete different dog, you know, um, and with the puppies, especially, you know, I'm I'm down there a lot playing on their level and, and, you know, a dog like Dante, sometimes it's hard for them to cuddle and just to be still. Mm -hmm. So I'll work on that, you know, I'll get on the ground and I'll, I'll play with them and I'll rub them. But then I do put him in a position where, you know, on his back, like laying with me, like, Hey, I need you to calm down. You know, because later on at the vet or cutting his nails or doing examinations, he has to be able to deal with all that stuff. And so we have to prepare them now for that, not when he's 85 pounds. You know what I mean? Right, right. Because then it's going to be a bigger problem. And of course, being restrained for any of us, any mammal. I've never met a mammal that's like, yeah, restrain me. That's great. Well, yeah. Within reason. <laughs> yeah. And, and and you know what, Martin? That's something that I do um, lack in. I don't spend enough time doing stuff like that when they're young. You know? Like, sometimes it, I just don't think of it or I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And you're running around like a chicken without a head. And, and I should do. There are trainers out there that are do a ton of that and it pays off in the long run it really does it does because it calms them down they, they understand sure you know what is going on absolutely so have you leash walked young mr dante yet yeah only only on a flexi lead only you know so at this age i want him exploring when we go on a walk you know like i don't need him walking trying to walk next to me at this age i want him to be a puppy mm-hmm. so take him out on a flexi lead and he could run around wherever he wants all over and coming back in. And, and, you know, I don't use flexis with regular dogs with, but with puppies, man, they're, they're pretty awesome. 
<laughs> you know, there's no tangling, there's no nothing. They come in really handy and it gives him that freedom, but it also teaches him that leash pressure because he has so much freedom on that flexi that when he starts hitting the end of that, they learn how to turn and start coming back. Right. And then I'll just start marking and rewarding that also. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just as he, he hits the end, he's like, oh, okay, too far. And he's headed my way. I'll just mark that and reward that a little bit here and there. And I don't do much mm-hmm. rewarding of that, but just here and there. So the puppy never knows when it's going to happen, you know? Mm-hmm. And then the up and then makes it positive. The feel of the reaching the end becomes positive. The turning back and coming towards you becomes really positive. Sure. All of that is just, is just good. Uh-huh. Um, do you get a lot of stopping? Like I'm, I'm in, so I know you live in Kentucky, I believe, and, and it's yeah. a little different than in down, like in Boston or in Dorchester where I am. Sure. So we, yeah. I do block walks with my dog, basically, you know, I go different ways, but basically I'm doing a rectangle. Um, yeah. even with my puppy, when she was young, I'd use a small rectangle, right? Are you doing anything yeah. like that? Where it's like, all right, this is where we're going. This is our route. And if you do. And if you do, do you find the puppy is stopping, putting on the brakes, refusing to walk? Do you walk the puppy by itself or do you walk with the group? That's yeah, it. no, I just, I walk the puppy by itself right now. Um, I don't want my pup. I give him plenty of time to play with Mango, especially. They play outside a lot and I use her to help wear him out a little bit, but I don't want to give the puppy too much time with the other dogs because I become a lot less important at that stage, you know, and I want to build that bond a little stronger with me and the puppy before they're released to just be with the dogs all the time. You know what I mean? Um, Your situation, the way you get to go for walks to me, being in the city is pretty much the best training you can do. You, You know, I mean, just, Taking your dog for a walk in that environment is so beneficial for these puppies. My neighborhood, it's a lot more quiet and the streets are real big. And, you know, there's traffic, but not like being in in Boston or New York or or something. So I make sure I go to like truck stops and busy gas stations, grocery stores and stuff like that, where there is a lot of activity and the puppy learns how to deal with that, you know. Excellent. Excellent. So a a retractable leash in the city do you think it's wild oh, yeah. or do you think it's a little yeah. different here yeah i don't think that would work out i don't <laughs> think that would work out too well for you yeah i would yeah. i probably wouldn't do that yeah maybe to a certain extent you know you would just have to implement a little more control you know uh, on it but it would definitely be a little more difficult for sure yeah, I would now. If you want to use a flexi lead in the environment, like a city environment, you can. I would just um, I would try to do it when we're in more open space. Like if you go to yeah. public park, switch the leash. Here you go. You know, sure. Um, it's a little different when you put a fixed leash on a dog because if they don't want to move forward, you know, they they can lock up and it, and it and the shortening of the leash actually increases the pressure the dog is under. You know, sure. so so definitely yeah. using the flexi is good. But if your dog is locked up, let's say the trash truck just went by, the guys hopped off, they're they're throwing the trash in, and your dog is looking and doesn't want to move forward. What would be your best tip in that situation? I'll, I'll usually walk towards the issue. Like for instance, my puppy had a weird reaction to a fire hydrant one day the first time he saw uh, yeah (laughs) first time he saw a fire hydrant he kind of was looking like whoa what is that so i just walk over i go straight to the fire hydrant i sit next to it i touch it i rub it you know i hang out with it and then he sees okay this is no big deal and we move on and so any situation like that i kind of take advantage of, of those things and i show the dog look this is it just like um you know if we're trying to teach our dog to jump over something You know, well, I don't try to get the puppy to go over something to jump over. If there's a little hesitation there, I'm just going to go over it first. Show Mm -hmm. the dog. They'll follow very quickly, Mm -hmm. you know. So leading by example, sometimes it's just that easy and and that beneficial for these these puppies, you know. Definitely leading the way. That's super important. So let's say the dog is locked up because of the fire hydrant. Are you talking Mm -hmm. to the dog? Are you going, hey, puppy, come over here. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing. Nothing. I don't, I don't say a word. I don't say, I don't say nothing. You know, I just, 
I like to do stuff like that in silence for the most part, you know? Excellent. That's it. Because yeah. you're showing more than telling, right? Absolutely. You're yeah. And going out. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a puppy that it took longer for them to come than you expected? Like to, to move along or move forward than you expected it would? Um, no, I've been, you know, I've been pretty lucky with puppies. Um, I've gotten very lucky at picking all the puppies I've ever picked. And I've just, I've never had, you know, I love working with fearful dogs. That's my favorite kind of dog to work with. But as far as my own dogs, I've never dealt with that with, uh, with any of them that I could remember. They've all been very strong dogs, you know? Excellent. 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 So um, can we talk about, about how much time in a day you spend with Dante in the crate? Most of his time out of the crate is spent outside with me doing things. You know, we spend a lot of time outside. Even if I'm just hanging out doing something, I just like him being out there. If me and my boy are throwing the football or playing basketball, I just like him to be out there. And then inside... The younger they are, the more time they're spending in the crate. And so as he gets a little older every week now, you start giving him that freedom a little bit, a little bit at a time as he can handle it. You know, when you could start telling the puppy, hey, get out of there, knock that off, come over here. And they listen, you know, now you can start giving them so much more freedom. But at eight weeks old, 10 weeks old, even 12 weeks old, when the puppies a lot of these puppies, they're not going to listen to what you tell them to do. You can't expect them to, you know? And so until you have some kind of control, you know, I think it's just beneficial to have the crate with you or have them on a leash. That's it. And some people get very lucky and their dogs are so laid back and mellow. You don't have to worry, but that's not the kind of dogs that I'm, I have, you know? And those people are rare, even if you don't, <laughs> even if, even if yeah. you have like that, King Charles Cavalier is still going right, to do right. all those things um, yeah. until it gets to a certain point. Um, sure. When you are outside playing with the with your son throwing the football and things like that, um, do you have the luxury of having a fence or are you tying out the puppy or what's the... No, what that um, that's a great question. I have a fenced backyard, but no, we're outside. I don't... My puppies from day one are loose around my property. I don't tie them back and I don't put them on a leash. And and the reason being, and you probably can't do this because of where you live. Mm -hmm. Okay. So people have to use common sense when, when I say something like that. Can this. you say that again, please, Larry? Um, one more time. That last yeah, sentence. You, you can't do that because of where you live. So people have to use common sense when I talk about something like this. Um, I could do that where I live. And the thing is, like where I live, we have, you know, I live on a little bit over an acre. It's a regular neighborhood. So I have neighbors and there's people walking by and there's dogs. But so many people that don't have to start their puppies off on their own property on leash from day one. Puppies never off leash. You know, it's always on leash on the front lawn, backyard, whatever. And then the problem is the first time that puppy gets off leash and experiences a little bit of freedom, it's like, holy smokes, I'm going to take advantage of this. I prefer that freedom, that off-leash freedom, never to be a novelty for my puppies, okay? So you take advantage of them wanting to be with you, that social pressure where they don't want to leave your side. So in the beginning, when we're outside, you know, the puppy, he's going to follow you. Dante happens to be very independent, mm -hmm. and if we're done playing, he'll take the toy and he'll go lay on the grass and just hang out by himself and just lay down and not move, you know? And if someone comes walking by, he may look, he may stand up and even take a step. He'll just observe, but it's not a big deal to him because from day one that he's been here, that's been natural. Now, if you live in downtown Boston, you can't do that. If you live on a busy street, you can't do that, you know? But because I live the way I do where I'm at, we can get away with that, you know? Definitely. Definitely. Um, are you concerned that as he grows up and he enters into his later adolescence that you might see some more of this like rule, not even really rules, but like he might start to become more curious, might want to wonder more. Do you have a plan yeah, for that? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I usually pay attention to that stuff and see how much I can trust them off leash. Like, like for example, with Luca, 
when Luca was young, I never planned, you know, I don't start any e-collar training till the dog's a little bit older. Okay. I, I want all the training done before the dog ever sees an e-collar. And I planned on starting Luca around a year old and he was really well trained, right? Super, super obedient. At four months old, he went after a cat and I called him and he stopped on a dime and came back to me. Right. When he hit around nine months old, and that's where you start seeing in a lot of these dogs, we start seeing the issues, right? Eight or nine months old, you start seeing the real dog come out. Mm -hmm. I remember when we were out front playing, he started becoming a little, not reactive, but when people would come by, he'd show a little strength and protectiveness over the property and growl a little bit. So instead of waiting to a year, I said, okay, now it's time for me to start the e-collar training with him for one simple reason, not to punish that behavior, but to be able to still allow him that off-leash freedom without tying him to a leash or to a tieback where he could experience that. But God forbid he decides not to listen to me one day and go towards someone. I don't have to worry about that. You know what I mean? And so that's why I started at that moment. Now with Buddy, my daughter's golden doodle, that's the youngest I ever started a dog, five months old. But again, there was a reason. We just moved into this house that I'm in now. We built, we had this house built. We moved in here in January, middle of winter. We had no grass. It was all mud, right? So my other dogs could be off leash and I could tell them, hey, don't go out there. They'll listen. Well, with a five-month-old puppy, you can't. So he was living on a leash and I felt bad for him. So one day I came home, I told my daughter, I said, today we get Buddy off leash. And I took three days to train him like I do every day on the e-collar. And then now he was able to run free with the other dogs because I can keep him away from the mud without ever punishing him, yeah. without ever setting him up for failure, just teaching him how to pay attention to us, you know? Yeah. So there's always, I have no set rules. I just work with, with that dog needs. Does that make sense? That does make complete sense. And I already know how you use your e-collar. We do a lot sure. similar because I've studied and watched your videos and I've learned a lot from them. Um, so yeah, we, we should have a conversation sometime later about that, sure. um, about, about e-collar stuff. But, but I use the same way. I don't use it to punish the dog. It's not, yeah. that's not my intention. Um, all right, so playing fun. Um, any kind of games, tricks, or anything other than the crate training and those kind of things that you do for fun with him? Yeah, pl play is huge. You know, I play with all dogs, not just my, my own dogs, but clients' dogs. Play is a huge part of that program. Um, I've always been very big on the relationship between the dog and the, and the human. I've always preached that much more than obedience, you know, um, I just think if you can make that connection with that animal to where you guys are a team and there's that understanding and there's that trust there, then obedience is really easy. Yep. Not the kind of obedience you're doing with your little dog. That's not what I mean. That's not easy. <laughs> Killing it, man. That's incredible <laughs> stuff you're doing. Yeah. You know? But I do like to play a lot. And, and so I, in the beginning, I showed a lot of videos of Dante, you know, just teaching him how to chase a ball, yep. you know? And, and people... They say, oh, my puppy won't chase a ball. He won't bring it back. But they take an eight-week-old puppy and they throw, they throw the ball 50 yards. That doesn't work, <laughs> you know. So, and, cause, and I say this because a lot of people said, oh, my gosh, I see, like, you're only throwing the ball, like, not even a foot away from you. Like, that's it. Just introducing <laughs> the movement. Why do I want to walk movement. over there to get the ball? <laughs> yeah, puppy's not going to go chase the ball. But when you start just moving it, you know, six inches to a foot away from you and you're playing. Now the game becomes fun, yeah. you know, and, and that's, that's what it's all. That's what it's all. So just now I was outside with him and we did a little bite work on a, on a flirt pole and, you know, he was biting real nice and I stopped moving for a while and cause I did it on purpose. And as soon as he released his bite, I snatched it from him and he got angry. He tried to get, and I put it away. I want him to know, don't ever release on the yeah. bite until I, until I tell you to. Yep. 
But instead of giving it back to him, we just played with no ball, no bite, no nothing. I got down and I smacked them and I pushed them away from me and we did some rough housing and we just had a good time with each other. You know, yeah. that was it. Yeah. If you want to keep playing this game, then you have to play by these rules. We can still That's play it. and have fun, but by not using those rules, you choose not to play that game. Right. Yeah. And, so, and you know, some a lot of people don't have the, 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 the discipline to end it right there. Yeah. You know, they want to keep going, but the puppy will learn very quickly, like, oh, I shouldn't have let go of that because now it's gone, you know? Excellent. Excellent. So um, you're talking about you want to do training with them and compete with them. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I definitely want to throw my hat in the IGP ring, IPO, shoots in. You know, it changes once a month, the mm -hmm. letters that they use. And it's a lot of work, and I've never done it. I've taught all the behaviors all my dogs that they use in those combat except tracking and that's that's what scares me the most I, yeah. I don't have a lot of experience in tracking so there's a lot I have to learn and so to be successful in something like that for one you need a good dog I think I probably have a good dog and even though I know how to teach all the behaviors used you have tracking you have obedience you have protection I know how to teach all three things. That doesn't mean I'll be able, I'll be good at teaching it for that particular sport. Right. There's people out there that have a ton of experience and know how to get there in a better, more efficient way than I could ever imagine because I've never done it. You know what I mean? So I just want to kind of jump on the coattails of people that have been doing it much longer and have been successful in it. And so hopefully they can guide me in the right direction and, and where I can have a little little bit of success with, with my puppy. And, and, and I'm in no rush, so I plan on taking my time with it also. Exactly. So I can learn as much as I can and not put things on the puppy to where I'm doing things wrong to make his job more difficult. You know what I mean? Yep. Just enjoying the journey, definitely. That's definitely. it. That's that's the, it. I think that's the main point of the sports anyway, is, is really sure. to just have another way to interact with your dog, a game that you're basically playing. I've never, Absolutely. I've, ne I've done bite work when I was at our national canine a little bit, but I've never, that's never been something that's really interesting to me. I'm much yeah. more interested in uh, circus type stuff, you know, handstands yeah. and things like that. And, um, and with, uh, and with like hurting and things like that, I'm more interested in that just who I am. But, um, yeah. but I think it all comes down to the same thing, having routines where you're able to play with your dog in kind of a structured way, enjoy your time together and just move sure. on, you know? Sure. Yeah. And, and the way I train my dogs, Martin, I like to teach them and train them to where that connection and the learning is very strong, that where whatever route I decide to go with them, it shouldn't be that difficult to start heading that way. Does that make sense? It does. Like the dog knows how to learn and knows how to learn from me. And we've laid a good solid foundation down to where we kind of get each other, you know? Right, right. That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Well, it's been long and I know that you're a very busy person. I thank you so much again for, for uh, having this. I know it will help a lot of people. It's helped me and I will definitely, I know it will help a lot of people just hearing you talk about the struggles you have with your puppy and, yeah, um, and uh, the things. I hope he gets better soon. Um, yeah, me too. And, and listen, you, you're, you're one of the first people when I started doing my interviews, you were one of the first one to accept and, and, and come on. And, you know, I don't forget things like that. And I was very grateful and I'm glad we did it. And, and you were kind of at the beginning of something that turned out to be a pretty cool thing, you know, and, and yeah. we were able to talk to a lot lot more people of color after that in the dog training world and it's it's been amazing and you were uh, i think you were the second person i talked to actually you, i think you were the you were one of the first people i called I so i'm very grateful that. for you there brother i appreciate, appreciate you. that so much is there anything coming up that you want to mention or um or is there anything that you want to talk about real quick no, I just want to go hide and not answer the phone for the next six months. <laughs> I, I I heard one of your things. You said that you were booked till twenty twenty two, or yeah, wow, yeah, I I, I overdid it this 
this year. Um, too many seminars, and I don't like doing seminars. I really don't. I, right. It's you know, I don't put myself out there and like, hey, you know, you hire me for a set. I don't like it. I don't You're like too to good do at it. them, man. That's what it is. You're very good at. I, I see well, them. I don't know. I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't take it for granted that people give me the opportunity to do it. It's just I like being home. Yeah. And. I like being home and I just like working with my own dogs. And when you're not home, you can't do anything with your own dogs and you're away from your wife and your kids and it's tough, you yes, know, definitely. it is, but people treat me very well and I'm, I'm definitely very blessed there. And I'm, I, I have nothing to bitch and complain about. You know what I mean? Excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, have an excellent day and I hope uh, no one calls you for a little while. Hopefully you got six brother. months. Hopefully not. That's too long. But, you know, six hours. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Appreciate you, buddy. Thank you. Have a good one. See you, man. Bye-bye. Okay, so I'd like to thank Larry for coming on. Um, I enjoyed the conversation with him. And just like everybody else, you know, we all have challenges and we have to deal with those challenges as they present themselves. Um, if you like what you've seen here today, definitely click a like. Um, give us a subscription. Check out the channel. There's a lot of different things on the channel. Um, check in the description below for other links to our other social media. And until next time, enjoy your day and enjoy your dog.